Hi, I'm Dilka Stavis and I am an artist who primarily works in watercolor right now. And one of my main artistic inspirations is just how creating art, there are just so many possibilities. Uh, there really is no limit to the different ways you can combine things to create something new. And one of the things that brought me to painting in particular and watercolor painting to be even more specific is just the range of creative expression you get with brush strokes. I look forward to answering all your questions and I can't wait to see you there. Hello everybody, thank you so much for joining us today. I am Kathleen and I'm with Etcher Studio and I'll be your host for today. For those who are new with Etcher, we are an art learning platform who works with art teachers from all across the globe. And today's free demo is brought to you by one of our resident artists, Jill Gustavus. And this works as a preview for her 90 minute class, which she will be talking about later. Um, and if you're curious to know what's a resident artist, it's um, the resident artist program brings back um, most of, of some of the well-received artists for Etcher Studio, and they'll be doing um, lots of cycles of classes so they can really showcase their um, knowledge in a specific technique. And Jill's one of them. So I will be really expecting lots for Jill for this cycle. So um, if you have any questions, just type them in all capital letters um, in the chat. Um, and if you're going to be following along today, just have your materials ready with you. There is no reference photos, so no, ch um, no challenge with that. And we have a private Facebook group. So if you're not part of that yet, so make sure you are a part of that so you can post what you'll be doing today. And with that said, Jill, can you let us know what you'll be doing today and how that connects to your Etcher class? Yes, of course. Well, thanks for having me again. Um, and today we are going over one of the fundamental reasons people get into painting, and that's brush strokes. Um, the versatility of what you can do for a mark with your paintbrush is the reason you are painting and not drawing, um, because you can just get so much more expression out of it um, as long as you know how to utilize it. Um, and so we're going to be kind of going through uh, two different strokes that you can do with a round brush, um, just to keep it really basic. Um, and this is uh, just a standard synthetic, this is the Etcher 12. Um, so we're gonna be kind of going through at that scale. And I'm gonna be talking about some variables that make even just these two brush strokes, you know, have infinite more, more possibilities and variations. Um, I frequently do, you know, studies where I like take maybe one kind of brush and change my variables of what I'm working with to see what different strokes I can get. And the reason we do that is so that when I'm in a painting, I can quickly suggest objects and create things that look more effortless um, or maybe are you know, a good way to get something down fast if I'm working plain air, um, et cetera. So you can see I've got, um, I'm gonna be working, try and keep it all in one page, but I've got a second page if I, if you guys want some repeated strokes, I have some room to spread out. Um, but we're gonna be going through, like I said, two strokes. And this is kind of give you a taste of what we're doing in the mini workshop, which is we'll be doing six strokes with three different brush types. So we'll be using a round, a flat, and a dagger brush. Um, so just think about this, but like spread out the possibilities. Um, and we'll also be doing more detailed ways to combine them in different thumbnails. So we'll be doing two different thumbnails using three strokes each. These are just examples of what you could do, um, but that will be kind of in that workshop. All right, so I hope you have your round brush ready. And so I have three different colors here. Um, for the most part, you only really need one. Um, so I'm mostly gonna be using this um, in Dan Throne Blue because it's a nice dark blue. Um, and the puddles that I'm kind of going to be working with is like a, not the darkest you can get it, but just like a standard um, cat hair, <laughs> uh, just the standard um, dilution, um, just so I can see it. So that's kind of, if you, if it goes out of frame, that's what I'm, what I've got there. Um, and you can see, I'm kind of turning my brush to make sure the whole brush is coated in paint, not just the tip. Um, so, the first stroke we're kind of going to be doing is if you have watched any 
videos on painting like loose florals or um, a lot of beginner watercolor classes kind of cover this stroke. And that's um, when you just take a pointed round and press down and lift up. So like a standard stroke would give you a stroke kind of like that. So that's pretty, pretty standard. A lot of classes kind of cover that. The kind of magic happens with this stroke when you start to combine strokes. So you do them in combination and let them flow into each other. And that's when you start to get more of an idea of like object form. Um, so the angle that you're kind of holding it at, I'm usually holding it at about a 45 degree angle. So usually like that. Um, you could try different, so because if you hold it more flat and parallel to the paper and do this, you're not going to get quite as that belly of the brush. That's not going to spread out as much. So if you're experiencing any issues making this, just check um, your angle. And then once again, if you're more vertical, you're also maybe not getting that full width. So your angle of your brush definitely makes a difference um, doing this stroke. And um, there's other different factors that also kind of come into play. So if I add like lots of water and make a really wet puddle and make sure my brush has a lot of like almost to the point where it may, might drip um, a really wet brush and put it down, you're gonna see it's going to create more puddles. Um, along the stroke, you're gonna get more um, areas where the water is diluting it and kind of pulling the pigment around. And then if I wanna do, so I have more pigment and I'm also gonna kind of blot my brush on my towel here. If you do a drier brush, that's a little too dry. <laughs> you can see you get more texture. And so not to say any one of these is better than the other. You just want to kind of play around and start learning how to get the effect that you want. So say this was the second layer on a leaf or something like that to add some, some shadow and some depth or some texture. You might want that. So you might want to know exactly how much water or pigment is on your brush um to achieve that so we have wet and dry um, you also get different results whether you're doing something fast or super slow so you can see the difference just between those two strokes and they had the same amount of paint on them so this ends up being a little bit more like that dry brush just because it's going along. Um, this is a cold press paper, so it goes along and it just hits the peaks of all of those, all of those um, texture on the paper. So I'm going to clean my brush real quick because the other um, kind of variable requires me. I'm just going to you can kind of see my water is a little tinted already, um, which is kind of good because you can see what I'm doing. I'm just making a rectangle of water. And this would to be to simulate if um, you were painting wet and wet. So I wanted to coat the page. I'm just really making it sink in a bit. So if I take the same amount of paint that I've been working with and do that stroke in this wash, you can see it loses a lot of that form, but it kind of, so say if we combine strokes, it might be great, a great option for you to modify this stroke if you were, say, painting something into the background. Um, you want it to be a little diffuse. Um, you want it to be not quite as sharp and not get quite as much attention. This can even still be modified if you put more pigment on your brush and work with a drier brush, but you know, not so dry that it's lifting out the water, but more that you're charging in more pigment and you can see the difference there it holds that shape a bit more because there's less water in my brush that's like whooshing out so 
the other thing to kind of keep in mind, another variable, is the size of your brush. So like I said, I'm kind of using this 12 as like a standard mid-range brush that would kind of be used with a sketchbook of this size. Um, a lot of times, sometimes when I'm teaching, um, I see um, people like, I, I, I know when I started watercolor, I gravitated to something this size first because it was more akin to like pencil size. I kind of came into watercolor from a drawing background. Um, so you would try to replicate all of these techniques with the brush that you are currently using. Um, and it's kind of good to know when to step up the size of your brush because with a smaller brush, you have to scale down your, your brush strokes. Um, so if I were to do the same brush stroke, it works on that scale. It does not work. Well, it works at a different capacity at that length. You're obviously, it's skinnier. So if you were doing combined strokes, got a little bit dry brush here. It just takes you more strokes and you end up with more detail or more, more you know, lines as, as the brush strokes combine. So you have to remember that. So if you're working with a smaller brush, um, it may not necessarily save you time. Um, so always use that um, so by switching to the larger brush you can see I could get the same leaf done more quickly so if you're trying to cover a large area quicker use a different use a bigger brush um, they're not as scary you know as, as they sound <laughs> uh, the other thing to keep in mind um, is your bristle type so here I have a scroll brush um, compared to like a standard this is probably like a Taclon synthetic um, so very snappy, um, very smooth versus um, scroll, especially for a natural hair brush. Um, if I bend it, it stays in the shape. Um, and it also has different absorption properties. So if I do the same strokes, let's get the same dilution here. If I do the same strokes with this brush, you can see where it releases water is different. Um, the belly actually can kind of get a little bit larger. And this is not the same sizing, obviously. So that's a part of that. Um, so it's always good to kind of know when you're trying to replicate maybe someone's brush stroke technique that um, not every brush, brush can replicate every brush stroke style. All right. And so this brush stroke, if you're looking at applied objects, obviously you can do a leaf. Uh, that is probably the most um, uh, demonstrated versions. Um, you can also uh, do, um, sorry, my brain stopped there for a second. So I've got some extra colors here, just at Lizard and Crimson and Nicolazo. Um, you can also do any object really, and say like if you were doing, an apple. The benefit of being able to combine these strokes together allows you to follow the form of that object. And then you always kind of combine it with, you know, additional strokes, so adding in maybe some shadow or letting your color bleed to like do a shadow. So you never want to just rely on one brush stroke to create your, to create your painting. I always like to combine it with other other techniques. But you can see how quickly I was able to suggest the curvature of this apple. Um, you could also do like a pumpkin or you know something fun like that, where this type of stroke, when done in the form, adds to the believability and the suggestion of that object. Um, so that's uh, kind of like pressing. You can also add as you gain more dexterity in your fingertips. Um, if you add a little twist to the stroke, so you press down and kind of twist it at the same time. I need a wetter, a wetter brush. Um, if you don't have a particularly snappy brush, what it does, and you see I'm just twisting the barrel around, um, is if I'm not talking at the same time. It uh you can get a finer point. So with something that's snappy like this brush, 
you don't see too much of a benefit. But if you were to take a softer brush, really load it up here, and press down, because these bristles are not going to come back by twisting this, it twists the, uh, the bristles back into a point. And I can get a sharper point and I can get it to come back to something that I can then, you know, get the next object in. So more control, knowing your materials. That's always a good, a good start. Any questions on the first stroke? So far, there are no questions. I guess okay. you guys are too busy twisting those brushes. <laughs> so, <laughs> it takes yeah. a lot of concentration. <laughs> um, yeah, it does. I, I figured that out too. <laughs> um, so the next stroke is if you have taken my mini workshop on the negative painting skyscapes, um, this is a brush stroke that I have in that mini workshop. It's kind of like the backbone of it. Um, and so to kind of show you the mechanics of it, I'm first going to draw a line. You don't need to draw a line unless it helps you. Um, but I'm going to draw two of them. Because as I was explaining this to some students, I was trying to explain that the brush tip doesn't move. Um, so I'll show you what I mean. So this is, um, if, you, if there's a name on it, I would say like drag and lift. So we're dragging the point and then lifting the rest of the brush occasionally. So what that looks like is keeping your brush point on this line, you're dragging it and then kind of pressing down on the brush and then slowly lifting it, keeping that point on this imaginary line. I mean, you know, you can go up and down, but for the, the purpose of demonstration, it's easier to keep it steady. And so what you can see is you're getting this really organic shape as the brush touches the paper at different areas along, along this brush. So this is using a round brush. So you get some variation, not a ton. Um, in the mini workshop, we'll be doing this with a dagger brush, which gives you so much, so much variation. Um, it's actually the brush I use, or a similar brush to the one I use in that mini workshop with the skyscapes. But you can also see like, if you were to hold instead of at like this 40 degree angle. So this one was done with my brush at about a 40 degree angle. If you do it more parallel, so my brush is, you know, parallel with the paper. So if you do it parallel at times, so I'm lifting, kind of lifting up, pushing down, lifting up, you can see I get not, I can't keep my tip on the paper, which gives you a different look. So it's kind of this variation all depending on your angle and how you can kind of use those together would be if you wanted to say, make some clouds. This is one of my favorite techniques to quickly put in clouds. Um, the problem is you have to kind of get a handle for not making your clouds look like lines. <laughs> so then you have to kind of learn how to come back in and, you know, add more organic natural brush strokes to kind of fill them in and make them more puffy looking, you know, versus um, I went up and down a few times, you know, you don't want it to look man-made, you don't want it to look gimmicky. Um, you always want it to look, you know, effortless. And a lot of times it just comes with practice and perhaps knowing where you want to put your brush down and up in advance does help because um, otherwise you can get carried away and do like a whole bunch of valleys, uh, which doesn't always read the best um, if like landscapes aren't your thing. Um, so there's also like floral ways and this makes you know, a green here. So it's in the same color. Um, say using the same theory that say, you want to keep the point of your line on a swivel. So I'm pressing down, keeping my brush along that line. And then if you flip, and remember, you can always turn your paper too, um, as long as it's not like tape to your desk. If you do the same thing on the reverse side, 
sudden you have like a really interesting leaf shape. Um, so this is a really quick, easy way to not draw something. You're just, you're making your brush make the marks. Oh, and someone says in the comment, is that for C? I do waves this way. Do you also do waves? With like um, yeah, I don't paint water too often just because I don't live near the ocean. Um, a lot of times when I paint water, um, I use, there's actually a different technique that I'll be teaching in the mini workshop, a uh, different brush stroke. Um, there's not quite as turbulent of, of waves, but you could definitely um, use this. Let's make like a quick teal here. Um, you could use this to say, um, I need more water. So once again, looking at your variables, dry brush, uh, <laughs> and sometimes it, it breaks up. And my earbud is slipping out. Um, so you could do that. And then doing less and less variation more into vertical lines or horizontal lines as you as you go away. And then always remembering it's not your positioning is not anchored. So what I mean is you could then come back and do it the other way. So I'm pressing down every once in a while. And so there's our front or wave crest and then maybe putting some clean water to let that lead out. And that's how you could kind of get, you know, really quick frothy effortless waves without trying to draw every nook and cranny um so you can see the difference between like I, when i was doing that the wet and the dry um it's got the same sort of breakup so if it's super wet you're going to get those puddles which is really nice um when i do skyscape sometimes it's nice to then take those puddles once they dry and read into them and then like use negative painting to make those farther clouds that are a little bit, you know, faded. Um, now, if you were to go on the dry side, that could be, you know, it doesn't even need to be, you know, clouds. You could use this for, um, I'm trying to think of what texture that it kind of looks like a, if you use like a brown, it could be a good like stone or, um, yeah. rock color. So you can see there's some nice breakup there. Mm -hmm. Speaking of dry brush, um, I would want to cut you off <laughs> with that. Oh, we've got mm. a lovely question from Raina. Um, how can I get the dry brush effect on cold press paper? I found it difficult, especially for trees. So on cold press paper, actually, I find it's a little easier because um, hot press paper doesn't have the the hills on the texture, the tooth to catch your brush. Um, but so on cold press, so the key to just getting like a good dry brush is to have enough paint, but not enough like water where because the water is what's facilitating the um, the paint to go onto the paper. So I guess I'm not maybe are are you getting too much water? So you get blobs for trees. I'm trying to think. Of, let me get some nice green here. So I have some green paint, but at this dilution, it would probably be nice and puddly. But if I blot my brush a little, take out some of the water. And it, once again, this changes with what brush you're using. So this synthetic is very smooth. The bristles aren't going to, you know, break up as much. Um, so for example, if I switch to the scroll here, here, and this might be too soft. So you can see it's catching the, the things. Um, but we'll go over the, this sort of mark in the mini workshop. Um, that's one of the six. Um, I like to call it a squiggle. Uh, <laughs> but I'm sure other artists call it other things. Um, but yeah, so it's learning how to control the amount of moisture in your brush is an ever going struggle. Uh, learning, you know, as, as an artist. Because every brush is going to be different. Um, all right. So once again this technique changes also if you're going fast or if you're going slow i forgot to switch back to my other brush <laughs> all 
because this one, uh, the, the synthetic has more of a tendency to break up when you're going fast. And then I get more of a complete shape when I go slow. So depending on how careful you want your look to look, obviously more texture going fast, uh, more accuracy going slow. Um, and then also mimicking that wet and wet. Get some more paint. So doing the, the regular dilution kind of first. So if I put my brush at the top, and do the same stroke in this wet puddle. You can see I get these really nice fluffy clouds. And then if I go with a stronger dilution, I'm gonna get still a soft edge, but definitely um, a little bit sharper, a little bit more um, detail there. It doesn't, it doesn't, um, move around as much in that wet wash. So a lot of, <laughs> any questions? Yeah, um, just to follow up on the previous question about the dry uh -huh. bread, does it make a difference if um, Raina right here is using silver velvet brushes? I'm not sure if you're familiar with mm -hmm. the problems mm -hmm. of that. Yep. Uh, let's see, so silver is a mix of, um, real squirrel hair and and synthetic. Uh, so the water retention properties will be between those two. It depends on also like the shape. So um, actually I have some right here. And this I will use a smaller one. <laughs> so I'm choosing a brush size that fits the area and the size shape. That's also an important factor. Um, And then since I want to do dry brush, I want to do blot it a little bit. And so right now my brush is almost parallel. And so I find it easier to use it that way. Um, now, if you use it this way, what's happening is the water is using gravity and it's flowing down to the tip of the brush. And so you're more likely to get a solid shape. Um, so that might also be something you're encountering. Right. So kind of like more of using the belly instead of like the main tip. So using the side of your brush will give you more of a dry brush effect. It doesn't matter even like what so a lot of times people who use flat brushes um, use, um, say, if like this is your flat brush, you use it this way, like right. parallel to the paper and you'll get this like scrape effect um, versus if you do it this way then that water is coming down the brush via gravity and it's, you know, sitting at the tip of the brush and you're basically just pulling down this sheet of water. Um, it's the same kind of principle behind, um, like when you do a, a flat wash, you always want that bead of water at the bottom and then you move the bead down. It's kind of the same effect just in your brush. I see. Well, that explains so much. Um, we have um, another request actually from mm -hmm. Beth. Could Jill show us her preferred way of lifting the water when too much is applied, paper towel or a special brush? A oh, good question. Um, so it depends on the effect you're kind of going for. If it's um, a cloud per se, um, so like if it's, you're doing a skyscape and there's a little bit too much water, I would use a paper towel because I'm going to be able to lift more of it off. However, um, a paper towel can very quickly take off too much of your water and just leave you with a stark um, like mark. So for example, example, if I have this and say like I had too much water and there's like a puddle and it's a big mess. Um, so if I wanted to get like a crisper line, I would use my paper towel to get a nice clean um, removal. However, if it's just too much water and it's like gonna take forever to dry, I would actually see if I can tilt my paper so that it puddles in one area and use just a thirsty brush and just kind of vacuum up. And this, this way you're less likely to disturb some of the pigment that's already on the paper versus if you're using a paper towel, unless you're using like phthalo's colors 
or um, something that's staining, you're going to end up lifting a lot of the paint you just put down. Um, so that's kind of how I kind of gauge. The brush is a little bit more gentle, um, the paper towel a little more thorough. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for that. Mm -hmm. All right, and um, let us know if we have more questions um, and other curious, I don't know, um, requests, I guess. Um, but yeah, let us know, Jill, as well, um, if we have more stuff going on uh, while we wait for others to put in their questions or requests. I can show you some other ways, too, while we're kind of waiting there. Um, so like this example, she is the one I you know, kind of had up in my post. So some of the same things, this was um, not all the same techniques. Um, so this was like just stamping. Um, this was stamping in water. So depending on what technique you're doing, I just try and do it in different, different versions. So pulling um, two different dilutions. Um, so just explain so if people saw that, you know, like, well, what's the tie in, you know? Um, I just try and try different variables because Every time you paint, your conditions are different. Maybe your paper is different. Maybe you're painting outside and it's 80 degrees and things are drying instantaneously. Um, there's different, you know, applications too. So like this technique here, you can actually also use to like put in like a background around like something that looks kind of like a, like a peony here. Um, you know, you could use the same technique in different ways. It's really just down to analyzing what you're painting and having that pre-practiced knowledge already in you know in your brain great um oh we've got a question from mm -hmm. Rushika. uh what are some of your favorite synthetic and natural hair brushes ah um good question uh so for like a kind of a roundabout um because i do very different, different subjects i do botanicals um which i like both um, like a synthetic like this, like the Etra series is good for like really um, controlled detail um, because those synthetics are quite snappy. Um, if I am needing to do larger washes, um, I do tend to prefer, I will work, put down clean water and do like charging where you just drop in water um, with uh, like the Da Vinci mop here um, is the one I've been doing a large painting with um, that's usually behind me. Uh, I'm trying to think what else. Uh, what other brushes have I been using? <laughs> uh, the Princeton Neptune ones are good if you like want a softer bristle and want to go with the synthetic. Um, they're really great for um, for that sort of effect too. Um, and then in the mini workshop, I'll be the dagger brush I'll be using is a mix of synthetic and natural hair from Rosemary and Co. brushes. Um, it's a um, I can't remember what series it is, but it's like a uh, three three eighths inch dagger. Um, but yeah, so I kind of bounce around. I have a lot in my collection, <laughs> probably too many. Uh, but it's important sometimes also like don't use too many in the same painting because, like I said, you don't want it, things to look gimmicky. Um, right. You want it to look um, like you use the correct technique for the right purpose. Great. All right, and uh, let me see. We've got no more questions, but I see some people are um, sharing their insights as well, saying thank you, Jill. And uh, we've got a new llama. Um, thank you so much for introducing yourself. I'm glad that you kind of like um, joined this one too. Oh, do you have a go-to stroke for a quick floral, says Sasha. Quick floral. So a lot of my florals are usually not quick. <laughs> um, I tend to do uh, very detailed florals. I'm trying to think of which sketchbook I have. Um, so actually these studies were done with the smaller versions of the etcher brush. Um, so kind of more um, um, wow. detailed placements. I think these were also done with a, a pointy synthetic. Um, I have done Trying to think of what which other sketchbooks I have work in. <laughs> so this this was a similar. Um, it, I didn't have the etcher brushes at this time, but it was a very similar brush. It was the Princeton Velvet Touch brushes that I did uh, this one in. So, um, but loose florals, I would probably use a softer brush. Um, 
mostly because like, so this is one of my practice sheets for these workshops. And so these big strokes were done with, um, with this scroll quill. Um, so really soft, um, flowy, squishy um, texture. So that's kind of what I would use if I were doing uh, loose floors. It's what I do when I do a wet and wet, like under layer for my florals too. Um, but like I said, it's not my, my main way of painting them. Great. Oh, we've got uh, beautiful florals um, saying in the chat. Beautiful. Um, love the B&W. Your work is just beautiful, Jill. Um, and someone's asking about the red. Um, are we referring to the florals? Please, please let us know. Um, and let's see. Um, please let us know if you've got some final questions. Otherwise, um, while we are waiting for some of them, uh, we can go ahead and wrap up. So Jill, again, has a 90-minute class upcoming. Um, that's going to be on June 13. That's 4 p.m. Eastern time, if I'm not mistaken. Let me double check. Yes, that's June 13, 4 p.m. Eastern time. I'll be dropping that link in the chat. And um, if you will not be available during this time specifically, because of time zone um, concerns, then no worries. The recording will be up a few days later. So um, you can definitely rewatch it as many times as you'd like. And Jill, can you please reiterate what you'll be doing in the 90 minute class for the newcomers? Sure, sure. So we're going to be doing six brush strokes um, instead of just two. And although we will be repeating these, um, this one in particular will be done with a different shaped brush. So we'll be using a mixture of a round brush, a flat brush, and a dagger brush. Um, and I'll be showing different ways the strokes change with more variables, um, you know, in addition to like speed, angle. Um, and then after we go through three each time, um, we'll be doing, you know, a more comprehensive, you know, subject-based thumbnail. So the first three, we'll be doing a botanical thumbnail afterwards. And the second three, it'll be some sort of a landscape-based uh, thumbnail. Um, in both of these, they'll be kind of like off the cuff. Uh, there's no pre-drawing. Uh, <laughs> they're kind of from imagination. But it's just to show you how you do these strokes in the environment of a painting. So you never just are doing those strokes. You're always putting them together with other things, tying them together with just some average, you know, combination strokes. So it's always about the implementation, not just um, practicing the strict, strict technique. Great. Thank you so much for that. Um, and yeah, that is upcoming. So if you're going to be joining us, um, I've dropped that link in the chat and I'll be redropping that again uh, in case you missed that. So um but i see no more questions so um i think we can finally wrap up all right so all right everybody our time is up and i hope you enjoyed your time with etra studio jill as usual thank you so much for that lovely demonstration today um and we do these live demos these class previews a couple of times a week here on our youtube channel so make sure um to hit that subscribe button to make sure you get notified as well um, for the roster of upcoming live classes and if you love what you have watched today and if you love how jill has answered most of your queries please hit the like button below this video or drop a um drop your thoughts in our survey form which i'm dropping in the chat and um, we have also um, an upcoming art, open art studio, I'm sorry, um, open art studio. So you might want to join our private Facebook group to learn more about that, especially for our new llamas right here. I'm going to be dropping a bulk link in the chat for those. Um, and so while I'm doing that, Jill, do you have any final thoughts before we close the session? Yeah, sure. So actually speaking of the Facebook group or if people are on Instagram instead, um, if you practice this and you come up with some questions on these these particular strokes, um, you're feel free to tag me um, on the Facebook group. It's at Jill Gustavus Art. It's my page. Um, and then also the same thing on Instagram. So um, if you tag the full name there, it, it notifies me. So I know that come that you got a question and come come check it out or give you feedback or uh, whatever you'd like. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Um, I'm glad that you mentioned that that's at, you have to use the ats um, so that uh, it notifies our artists. And good question, uh, what is an open art studio? So that is a free um, and chill session um, done via Zoom. So it's open for everybody. And Jill, if you're free as well, you might want to <laughs> go ahead and follow along. 
Um, and we pretty much dropped the link on our private Facebook group. So you might want to check our Facebook group for announcements. So we just normally just do art there if you have queries. Um, and you, most of the people that you see right here in the live chat, you they will have finally faces. So <laughs> I think that's one of the most exciting part about it. Um, and I'm just going to read some lovely comments right here for you, Jill. So we've got... I can only wish Netflix had a tutorial arts show. <laughs> um, absolutely <laughs> fantastic, says Bev. Thank you. Um, Elaine says thanks. Um, and yeah, we've got really pretty comments right here. So you should go ahead and backtrack through this, Jill. <laughs> All right. I will do. <laughs> thank you so much, everybody. And thank you so much, Jill, again. And until next time, everyone, make more art. Bye for now. <laughs>